So I think many people in in Harare have always tried to sort of be um, resilient and adopt to changes that is happening in the city. And I think they've been doing that for a very long time. And I think the concept is trying to find ways of putting things together and surviving. And that's what most people are trying to do in the, in, in, in the city. And I think that's sort of in a similar manner what we try to do with Atarare, obviously uh, the country or the city itself had one festival used to happen, but that has actually uh, fallen through. And we thought with the opportunity that was presented last year with the shift to the online space, we would try to find ways of yeah being resilient and put together a, an event that celebrates the visual arts um, and the cultural producers in the city. So I think we continuing with that sort of tradition of trying to never give up, to always put something through and let our voices never die down. Yeah, I think if I can if I can jump in there and compliment what Richard has been talking about, I think this this idea of Ngwava Ngwava is actually a state of mind that has existed in Harare for quite some time. And what's interesting is that Ngwava Ngwava is the latest edition of this kind of like state of mind. But we can go back to the, I suppose, even early two thousands when people were talking about Kukia Kia, and these words keep coming up Kucheka Cheka. So what's interesting is this kind of like spectrum in the metamorphosis of this kind of like state of mind. So where are we now with this idea of Kungwava Ngwava? Is it like on the, you know, on the spectrum of intensity in terms of Kungwava Ngwava in relation to the political, social and economic issues that are happening in, in Harare? But also what's of interest in relation to art Harare, I think is this fact that, you know, you're starting an art fair in a pandemic, which I think if everybody, if you ask anybody, they will tell you this is the, could there be a worse timing to do this, right? <laughs> but this is actually also the opportunities that uh, come out of this kind of like crisis. So I think the fact that the art Harari at the moment exists in the cloud uh, space, you know, in, the, in, the, in this kind of like internet space, I think that's actually quite interesting because art Harari is yet to land in Harari as a physical art space. And I think there's every intention to do that uh, starting with art Harari next year. But at the moment, it exists in, the, in this cloud space. And I think that it creates int interesting interactions between you know, the diaspora community uh, of Zimbabwe, of creatives, of designers, of architects, but also the, you know, people who are on the ground in Zimbabwe. And I think the interesting conversations that are created there between you know, this cloud space and things that are happening on the ground. So from a day-to-day -day basis, I think the passion and desire that everyone puts together to admire the artists and all have the reason that we're working for this in a way is like hustling. And I think that um, putting everything together as you guys have touched upon during the pandemic and the hardships, but everyone is sort of coming together as a team to work to one towards one goal. That's what we're all doing. Um, I think is really, really encapsulate Art Harari, the project and everything. Yeah, I think there's also an interesting thing of, you know, working towards from the outside towards inwards, because it's almost like counter what we are used to, right? You know, so we are almost like working, uh, you know, against nature. Nature usually works inside outwards, and we are literally working outside inwards. So there's a sense in which Atarari is also trying, I think, to firstly create an audience that connects Harare with the global audience from the outside and then as we march towards Harare counter hegemonic to the pioneer column that actually marched towards Harare and we're marching towards Harare we will land in Harare probably next year and actually do a physical art fair in Harare next year. Yeah indeed, indeed. <laughs> I also think we in the context obviously of the continent as well it's obviously we're the new kid on the block um, with other art fairs happening mostly in South Africa and obviously in, in Lagos in Nigeria and some activities obviously happening across the continent. So yeah, I think in that way, we're also trying to position ourselves on the continent as well as a, yeah, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an initiative, as a project that speaks about Zimbabwean contemporary art. So in that way, despite obviously the pandemic and everything, the sort of hustling and trying to put things through um, and placing ourselves in the global context 
and the local and the African context as well. And yeah, and being part of this digital history, I think is quite important for, for, for the artists in Zimbabwe. I encountered Dambu Zamarichera when I was in high school, um, and it was a fascination of mine um, when I was still a young scholar and I read his works. And I remember actually this line, you know, um, I sing no more roses, but walk through Arari mazes. It was it's like an interesting provocation. So I wrote it down in my diary, which is now very old. So when the opportunity came to, to, to work with, uh, with Art Arare, and we were thinking about you know, uh, the curatorial statements together with the rest of the team. And I really wanted to break the silo, um, kind of like thinking around just visual arts, but to really position Arari as an incubator that has got a history of uh, great writers, that has got a history of great musicians, that has got a history of uh, great visual artists, uh, that has got a history of great creativity. But also, you know, to acknowledge that, you know, uh, there are transitions that have been happening in Harare, in the in, in Harare, and I mean, uh, as a metaphor of the country, in the political scene. So I thought that, you know, to bring something from literature uh, as a provocation for visual artists could really be an interesting, um, you know, kind of like way to think of a curatorial statement and to also create these bridges between these two kind of like, uh, you know, art forms. So that was, that was the original thinking of the, um, of the curatorial statement. But I think it also leaves room for all kinds of create, creatives to really think about, you know, what do you think about, you know, I think I sing no more roses, but walk through our other mazes. It's an open kind of like provocation around, you know, for people to think around what is a Harare maze from their own perspective. Yeah, I think it was, for me, it was quite, uh, yeah, an interesting link between obviously literature and the visual arts. Uh, I know Dambu Zamarichera very frankly, I wasn't much of a fan, but I knew of him uh, uh, through literature, and obviously he was a famous Zimbabwean author. And I think the, what I know of him, obviously he was in exile and then returned to Zimbabwe to a very different city from what he, when he left, and I'm sure that Sort of values that resonates with most people who are in the diaspora, most Zimbabweans. Um, when they go back to to Harare, for example, it is it is actually a very a maze um, because of how you actually navigate how the city has developed. So there's so much relationship to that statement to what is currently happening today. When you visit the the, the city, it has developed um, and changed in very 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 rapid ways. And yeah, I think that statement of Dambuza Maricela was relevant, I think, that time and is still relevant today. So I think each time I go back home, I'm like undoubtedly greeted by the same energy, the bustle and the warmth that comes from the city from the second I get off the plane or anything. But there is one thing that is always different. And I think that is the constant evolution, creativity and inventiveness that circles the city. I think that that's what never fails to astound me. Just what different people have come up with. There's always something new that people have discovered or a way around something. And that's what I truly feel is the element of the maze for me. It's a place that I call home and it's always bustling and originality is ever changing. Um, but the situations, they make you curious to navigate your way through and to explore because there's always something, like even if I'm not home for two months, I come back and it, if I go to an artist studio, there's something completely different that they've now discovered, a new material they're working with. And it's not just the new material, it's sort of like the concept of what does that material represent? And it's just, there's just so much that's constantly going on. So I think for me, that's how, how I associate like Harare as a maze. Yeah, fantastic. If I could follow up, I agree with Aya uh, very much because every time 
I think for me, uh, when I return to the city of Ali, the maze for me is actually a mental maze because there's so much. I think I'll tell you one thing is how currency is such a, a, a confusion of how much, how, how, how products are priced in certain currency, in a local currency, and when you're playing with digital money. To navigate that is, and to get to the end of the maze, to win that maze, it's very, very difficult for someone who's not coming, who's not living in the country uh, on a daily basis or in the city, because there's rates that change, there's prices that change constantly. And I, I, I give a hat off to, to those people who are currently surviving and living in the city, because it, it's nothing is really constant. And I think there is the beauty in that, that I think you make the same, and there's also maybe challenges that come along. But for me, that's the mental maze I face when I, um, when I experience a city, when I visit the city, of how when you have, because obviously it's also a cash, a cash economy as well, but there's also this digital money, and then there's the, 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 the local currency and sort of the US dollar currency and how products and business and sort of banking and all that is done, that mental maze is, yeah, for, for me, quite challenging. I think for me, the idea of the maze, I've actually kind of like tried to mute my own experiences because they are much more relatable to what Richard and I have explained. But what I've been doing is actually been researching, um, especially in the diaspora, meeting Zimbabweans across professions and actually asking them this idea of, you know, like, how do you relate to Harare at the moment? Or what, are, what is Harare meant to you? And what does Harare mean to you at the moment? So I've been in conversations with, uh, you know, Zimbabweans across professions, be they Uber drivers, be they, you know, uh, people in business professions or health, you know, in the health sector. And the, the feedback has been quite relay, uh, interesting around what, what Harare means for people. But also, I then got into kind of like a rabbit hole around thinking of Harare from the perspective of sound. So I started digging into these kinds of like um, uh, songs that have been sung around the name of the city, Harare. And for, off the top of my head, for example, Thomas Mafumo has got a song called Arare, Andy Brown has got a song called Arare. There's a South African uh, band, Black Jacks, that has got a song called Arare. And just to think about kind of like an um, album of you know, different musicians from different perspectives that have sung about Arare. And I think the most interesting song for me has been this band from uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which came to perform in Zimbabwe. This band is called The Real Sounds, and they've got a song called Arare. And they came to perform in Zimbabwe in Arare, and instead of going back to the D Democratic Republic of Congo, they stayed on in Arare, and they've stayed on for like now, I think the band has got new members, but they are now in Arare for over 20 years. So I think also this idea of the maze approaching it from a sonic perspective of different musicians who have sung about the city and all these songs have got a different meaning. So I think one of the interesting things that we will be able to do in the future around uh, at Harare is to think about a kind of like sonic archive about also Harare and different artists uh, and musicians who have approached the city from the sonic. Okay, yeah, I, for one, I think a lot of people have, um, yeah, have a romanticized and nostalgic view of, of the city. And I know a lot of people obviously send a lot of money, uh, more people in the diaspora send money to people to have family at home. Uh, most are actually building you know, sort of homes in, um, in the city. So I think they have that hope that one day things will go back to the park where we have a fantastic city, a functioning city, um, and a city um, we can all yeah, go back to. So I'm sure with that sort of activities and the, the, the actions that these people that are still doing, there is some form of yeah, romanticizing and some feel that the, the city will get back to sunshine glory, and we, yeah. And I think I think I think I would say that's a true statement. 
Yeah, I would say um, definitely to an extent that 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 is true. I mean, because of course, you know, the day to day, like the small nitty gritty things like fuel queues, prices changing. I mean, of course, those are like hardships and experiences that most of us who are located elsewhere are not facing from an hour to hour daily routine. But I do think that there's something which kind of bonds the two. And I think that it is that we are very conscious, aware and up to date with everything that is going back home. So even if I'm not physically back home, I mean, of course, I have my friends, my family, all my loved ones are back there. Um, so I think it's diff it is difficult because we're not living through it. But I mean, I guess Richard and Mike, you guys would feel the same. You are very, very like attached to that and want to know what's going on and feel really, really um, close to the situation. Yeah, thanks for that. I think I think this idea of nostalgia or romanticization is a very human condition. And for me, what has been interesting is the, the kind of like ways in which this nostalgia manifests itself, even in, you know, ideas of, you know, taste. So usually for people who travel, you know, you, you go back to Zim, you have a, a lot of people who say, when you're coming back from, from Zim, please bring me Mazoe, or please bring me something that reminds them of home. And that's quite an interesting thing that happens, right? So usually you, you, you go back to the diaspora with some kind of a food package. And people have got this idea that food from home tastes better, you know, and they've got particular products or particular things that they are really attached to on an emotional level. But and in, in our minds, we are literally convinced that these things taste better. I think it's more than taste. It's about memory because they remind us of, you know, a particular kind of like home or past that we no longer will actually have. But it is still, you know, kind of like, um, you know, captured within a particular food stuff, because then once you eat those things, then you remember quite a lot of things. What's also interesting is that this idea of nostalgia or romanticization actually doesn't start within the kind of like post-colonial condition of um, Zimbabwe, but also even prior. So they are also Rhodesians. <laughs> we've got a different kind of like nostalgia of what Harare used to be because it used to be called Salisbury, <laughs> you know? So you also see it, you know, springing up, especially in, you know, YouTube channels around, you know, Salisbury or what Rhodesia used to be. And then people are now talking about, ah, you know, the city has gone down or this, but I think for me, it's about the moving target of what people consider modernity. You know, you spoke, you asked us, you know, if this thing is, there's a romanticization or a nostalgia and if it's contradictory to what is happening now. I think Harare now is actually much more interesting uh, than what it was because I think there is something in which transitions, you know, the city is always transitioning. So the city, we are now speaking about Kungwava Nguava, we are now speaking about a do-it-yourself state of mind and we might not see it at the moment because we are in it. So we might compare what's happening now with the past. And then, you know, you make this kind of like black and white judgments. But I think there's something really innovative uh, and really modern about where Harare is. And I think some of these things, you only see them in the, uh, with, the, with time, so to speak. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I think... Um everything you said is so true and the point of nostalgia I think is really really an interesting point that I that, that I think I would like to touch on because nostalgia is not just about the memories and the associations that you have with back home like the other day someone at work just bought me a packet of Maputi one of my Zimbabwean colleagues and just that small packet of Maputi I mean I like ran and hid it I didn't want to share it with anyone because it was like I have something from back home I'm, I can't get home for Christmas I miss home I haven't been home and I think it's those small things that you sort of have like an attachment towards them. Um, and there's also like certain smells when you smell them, you, you just feel like you've been transported back to being home. So I think that the concept of nostalgia is a very interesting one that extends beyond just like memories and trips back home. It's all, it's, and it will be different from person to person. Yeah, I agree. I also sort of can jump in there. I think most people, um, especially of my age, I think they have, especially when they were young, sort of the activities that used to happen in the city as well. It would actually be an event for the weekend where people have to go 
to the Harare Agricultural Show or to some to the Harare Gardens um, and sort of activities that happen here. Um, that is a huge contrast to what's happening today. And I think it's, it's both positive and sort of and it's also challenges at the same time. Um, but I think, yeah, nothing sort of remains the same. But I think most people would always want to have, um, yeah, that history and that memory of spaces that, yeah, they grew up going to or experiencing. Firstly, there's the, I think cities operate in very interesting ways because there's a lot that is happening in a city like uh, Harare, you know, uh, there's firstly the music, you know, uh, there's Sungura music, there's Chimurenga music, there's now contemporary dance hall, um, you know, there's new forms of religion, people speak about prosperity, uh, gospel, for example, there are new ways of um, uh, transmitting, you know, the economy, especially with mobile money, uh, there are sirens in Harare that, you know, you encounter all the time. And these things are all like a subconscious, um, you know, undertone of the city. And I think the way that some of these things influence you, you might not be, it's not a straight line, but they are always there in the subconscious. But I can think of the practice of somebody like Wallen Mapondera, who really speaks of this idea of having been uh, influenced by Operation Murambachina, which was an operation that happened in, 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 in Arari around sort of like clearing out um, so-called illegal structures that had been built in the city and the materials that were left after this kind of like act of, you know, demolishing uh, structures that had been built by vendors. And then Wallen starts walking in the city and collecting material that has been used uh, by people is functional for functional structures for a completely different um, purpose and kind of like repurposing them and using these things as material for uh, for his artworks and I like I've been in dialogue with him and the idea here is not is beyond this kind of like idea of just recycling or repurposing because I think it's actually about resuscitating and extending the life forms of materials so it's beyond just recycling in the kind of like economic econometrics, uh, you know, thinking. It's actually about more philosophical than that. It's actually about when materials, uh, and maybe by extension or by met metaphors, when materials and people have actually been given up on, you know, is there a way in which we can think and never give up hope that we can actually resuscitate and extend the life form of things like materials, but also maybe extension, we can start with thinking about what else has been given up on that can be resuscitated and, you know, uh, you know, something around those life forms can be extended. And yeah, so I think that's that's quite an interesting thing. Um, and maybe Richard, do you want to add something with Mofa Takadiwa's practice or even Wallens? Yeah, no, if I could add to that, I think uh, many points you mentioned are quite true. But from, from my point of view, I think it was also the idea of the challenges that artists faced in terms of conventional material uh, to create their work. And I think there was this sort of revolutionary push to sort of use the materials that is around it. And I think most of the students, I know Mofat was given that task when he was still at school. Uh, I heard one of these talk when they were given an opportunity to go and create an artwork from materials around them. And then that's what we picked up until today to be his practice. And he's not alone, there's a lot of other artists that are using, um, are repurposing objects that are in many cases discarded. And I think these materials are, are found in the city. And, um, and I think that has been a very uh, interesting way that artists have used uh, sort of the materials that they found in the city in their work and sort of, yeah, comment on certain things. Obviously, Mofat talks about the sort of, yeah, the dumping of plastic materials from, from China and other spaces into the country that are coming in illegally. Um, and there's, I think as Mike has mentioned, the Maramba China and sort of the destruction in the materials that was produced and while in picking that up, um, there's also a lot of artists that are also using sort of modern uh, equipment like 
keypads to create, I think Mofat also did the same. Um, I think also in terms of obviously uh, concept, even Gareth Nandoro, in most of his pieces, he depicts street scenes. And that is something that they experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And those concepts are uh, what somehow um, gets interpreted in their work. So I think the city is very much uh, an environment that inspires the, the artist. And I think more, Gareth in a recent interview I had with him mentioned that it's his environment. If you were to take him out of that environment, of the city, out of the city, I think your work will suffer tremendously in terms of the sort of conceptual uh, processes that he uses to create the beautiful work he does. And obviously, obviously the kucheka cheka, kukwava guava, also that language that people talk is what Garrett uses as well. Um, and that's what he came up as his style. Kucheka cheka. And I think in it's similar to Kia Kia because it's trying to transform things, it's trying to come up with new ways of creating work, which is exciting. And yeah, I actually wanted to touch up on um, on the point that Mike was saying about using like the recycled materials because there's a very anthrop um, anthropological view which comes with that which i think is so interesting is like take a toothbrush for example us as human beings we all have our view of what a toothbrush is and its function and its material but here Zibab, um here someone like moffat comes and he's kind of he uses appropriation so he's taking that object and making something completely new it's the same toothbrush but it's just full of all these materials that we don't know exactly what they mean until we've seen exactly Moffat's view of it, how he's put it together, what he's trying to express. So I think like what Mike was saying, like often people will see a material and think, oh, that's rubbish, that's leftover, that's the scrap of something. And then someone comes in and that's like a focal point of their art piece and completely like reinvents the meaning of that object. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Aya, thanks, thanks for that, and thanks to to Richard too. And I think there's also something interesting around the dialogue between the city and what artists like Wallen Mapondera are doing. Because if you think of some of the materials that he uses, like cardboard boxes, right? Um, so somebody that's used for packaging, you know. But the moment you take out whatever it is that you have was, you know, packaged in the cardboard box, the cardboard box becomes useless to to people and is thrown away. What's interesting is that if you take a walk around Harare, you already see how everyday people appropriate that material cardboard box and use it for different kind of other uses, right? So they're already resuscitating the material. If you have ever seen a protest, people can write things on cardboard boxes as protest signs. Vendors are also, also selling things in the streets, right? Prices for whatever they are selling in the streets on cardboard boxes, right? Some people use it as sitting materials. Some people use it as sleeping materials. Homeless people might use it as sleeping materials. So the cardboard box has already been appropriated by a variety of people for multiple uses. And at the end of that process, that's when an artist like Walen Mapunder actually comes. And then also having observed these things that are already happening in the city, then inserts his own language using the material that people are using in the city. So there's a spectrum in which this material has been appropriated and used by a whole lot of people before it ends up in the language and in the framework of contemporary art. Yeah, definitely. Actually speaking about cardboard boxes, that's how I, how I came across this whole idea. Like in Hong Kong, I don't know if you've ever seen, but every Sunday, the whole walkways get filled with cardboard boxes and all the um, Filipino workers all crowd around there and like are on the phone doing each other's nails and every single Sunday that's a gathering and they just put cardboard all along the streets, all in the walkways and spend all day there. So of course, you know, I was really curious about the idea and started asking about it, learning about it. And it turns out that a lot of them are far from home. Some of them live in a bathroom. I know I'm going a bit off topic, but... <laughs> super interesting like the that kind of cardboard 
is sort of like a home for them. And the fact that they're all united and they come together every single Sunday with the, that cardboard is like a way for them to also, because they're treated not like they're welcome in Hong Kong, and that's a way of them to all come together and unite. So I think something like any material, we might not realize like the power behind it or you know the, the value that that specific material actually means and represents. Yeah, for me, it's that also looking at the tradition of art making in, in Zimbabwe, obviously there was a huge um, interest, obviously, with Shona sculpture, the sculpture, and then we moved to sort of an interest in painting. And now we're in this phase where we're using uh, repurposing materials to create work. And I think apart from obviously the main artists we talked about, Wallen, Gareth, uh, Moffat, they're also a bit of young artists um, that are coming along working with these repurposing material and coming up with new ideas. Uh, obviously, some of them being mentored by, um, by these artists who have started spaces in the city also to mentor the artists. Uh, Wilfred Timire is one of them using um, Masaga. Um, there is Clive Mukucha. Um, I know, um, also Tongesai Machiri is also doing something with the repurposed materials as well. So it's a, I think it's a new, um, sort of uh, ism that's coming on the contemporary art scene in Zimbabwe, where we use repurposed material in a quite interesting way um, to create works of art. I think firstly, it speaks to how we understand this idea of institutions and it's interesting that you you know we call them art spaces um you know so there's this kind of like terminology around institutions around art spaces around museums you know um and i think for me i actually see them as institutions in the making but institutions that are really being created for and are relevant to the context in which they exist in so firstly, uh, the spaces that you mentioned, Animal Farm in Chitungwiza or Mbari Art Studios in Mbari, the location of these spaces is quite interesting in relation to what one would probably understand as a contemporary art institution, which is usually in the center of the city. So I think there's an interesting relationship, firstly, with what's happening with the National Gallery of Zimbabwe, which is the traditional art institution in Harare and all these spaces that are you know, springing up. But I think to practical things, I think they are very, very important because they give um, you know, a lot of young artists um, spaces in which to operate, to experiment and to think and to actually produce work. You know, so there's now a diversity of spaces that young people can actually, young artists can actually be affiliated to and go and learn about art and go and make art and go and experiment about art. But what's also brilliant about these art spaces is that they're now thinking beyond Zimbabwe and they are actually making their own connections to the global art market, right? So we see spaces from Zimbabwe that are now participating at Johannesburg Art Fair, at Cape Town Art Fair, and that's Latitudes Art Fair and many other international art fairs. And that's really giving, I think, uh, opportunities for Zimbabwean artists to connect with the global art market. Uh, so I think that's, that's brilliant from that perspective. Aya, what, what do you think? Yeah, but I think that that also kind of goes back to, I think, the environment. Like I often think and question if these artists were somewhere else, would this amazing like community and sense of teamwork to create these spaces occur and exist? That's something that I'm, I'm always really intrigued by. But um, I think, for example, like Mbare Art Studio, just going there is it's just really, really impressive. And you you don't really, I mean, that's something also new to me. I only just went there, I think last year. And just knowing that there's so much, you go into a space and there's so many artists working on such different works, different mediums, different experiences and meanings all coming together. And of course, the beauty of it is like, kind of like a self-promotion. They of course, there's galleries and everything that, you know, that happens, but it's like having that within you to be united with fellow artists and putting something together and not just putting something together, putting something like phenomenal um, and doing that. So I think that, yeah, 
I'm very interested in the fact of independent spaces, and I and I I do believe that like the environment also plays plays a part in that because I guess if you are in a place that has like a lot of you know galleries and a lot of people and collectors, maybe you that that's not you know you you won't then need to seek to do that yourself. Um, so I do think that these independent spaces are very special and definitely a way to foster creativity and growth for the artist and for themselves. Yeah, no, I totally agree with uh, Aya and, and, and Mike. I, for me, I think I look at it as spaces where artists get mentored. And I've always said the best sort of art education is being mentored by another artist. Because when you sit in an art school, you don't really have that experience of what the real art world out there really looks like and sort of role figure, role model figures as well. So in most of these spaces, like Animal Farm Village, Wunumba, they have leading artists that are um, ahead in their sort of careers. And these young artists um, that are part of these collectives uh, working in spaces have a real world experience of how one can take their career to whatever level they want to take it with. So for me, I actually see them first as institutions for the artists to develop and learn themselves in a much more, I think, interactive, much more interesting way of uh, learning to be uh, creative and, and, and to sort of uh, develop one's practice. So I think they are very, very much important. And I think obviously our environment also forces our, forces many to, to, to sort of do that sort of from collectives uh, because previously obviously you would have to either go to the National Gallery, uh, Visual Arts School or the Harare Polytechnic uh, in which they could only take so many people. Um, and then now there's all these other opportunities that, that fellow upcoming artists that are on the pipeline can explore, can have, have some form of uh, instruction and direction and exposure, as we were saying, that some of the, art, the, the collectives are showcasing in international platforms or platforms on the, on the African continent. And I think this is quite, I'm sure it happens in other spaces as well, but I think for Zimbabwe, it's a well-welcomed occurrence that would keep future artists coming and being developed and we would always have um, interesting work coming out of the city and out of out of these spaces. Yeah, and I think to just add on to what you said, Richard, I think these spaces and institutions are actually quite important for even an art fair like Art Harare, because in a sense, they're actually the conveyor belt that feeds, you know, Art Harare with, uh, with, with the artists that are participating in this art fair. Not all of them, some of them are already established and independent, but they are, they are quite important, actually, partners um, uh, for, for, for Art Harare. And I think, of course, this is also a work in progress as we develop, we develop relations with, this, uh, with these spaces. But the idea is that these spaces are independent spaces and they are all over Harare and to some extent Zimbabwe. And then Art Harare becomes then that premium space where these spaces get to you know, feed into their artists. And for once a year, Art Harare you know, presents a premium show that showcases the best of what comes out of these art spaces. So it's a nice ecosystem that is being created um, within Harare and within Zimbabwe um, at large. Also in, you know, in complementary to all the other things that other spaces are doing, you know, so of course we acknowledge that what the National Gallery is doing in terms of, you know, uh, taking Zimbabwean artists to the Venice Biennale, for example, but Art Harare also comes in to complement that work so that we are all, you know, kind of like within this whole ecosystem of really putting the best of what contemporary art from Harare looks like in our own, you know, uh, various methodologies and ways of doing that. Yep, I, I definitely, definitely agree with um, everything Mike and Richard are saying, but I think there's also a sense of like these, um, one last thing is these independent spaces, they also create like hope and inspiration for younger artists, and I think that that's always something really valuable because often you might not feel like there's a place or you'll be able to achieve um, anything in your creative career, but when you see that there is 
you know, like a friendly space, a really positive place that's promoting growth and individuality. I think that can be an inspiration for a lot of um, younger artists hoping to enter the field.